Hi there, thanks so much for joining me today uh, for my talk about the Spanish flu and how it impacted England and Wales. My name's Rose Daverley Wadden uh, and I'm joining you today from sunny Southwark, or at least, well, I'd like to think it's sunny, but it's not very nice out there. And Socks the Cat has also joined me today. Um, you can just about see him <laughs> there on the sofa. So if you see him, <laughs> say hi to Socks the Cat. Okay, so let's get started uh, with today's talk, which is um, looking at the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which took millions of lives across the world. So today I'll be looking at how the Spanish flu altered the lives of many and the inevitable parallels that we can find with today's coronavirus pandemic. And so although this happened, this particular incident happened over 100 years ago, the Spanish flu is something that in today's society that we can really understand as we ourselves have lived through something so very similar. So today I'll be walking through how the Spanish flu took hold in England and Wales, how it took both victims young and old and how it changed the world forever. So here's something that you'll probably be a little bit familiar with by now. This is a 1921 census return form and this was filled out by Albert Dunn in the village of Little Stukeley, uh, which was historically a part of Huntingdonshire. And you'll notice something a little bit different about this census return. You can see the markings on here. Now this, this isn't water damage or heaven forbid mould or, or, or anything like that. We find out a little bit more about the substance on this census return form on the actual uh, form itself on the other side. And there's a long note here and you, you Sadly, probably you won't be able to um, read it, uh, but what it does say is that the substance that has been spilt on the form is crude carbolic. Now, this is a type of disinfectant and the note reads in part, slight accident with crude carbolic in cause of necessary disinfection of all transmissions and exchanges in this prehistoric village. It's a rather interesting note and Albert Dunn, who's filled out this return, seems like a rather interesting character. You can see that his profession here is reformer and he is his employment he's put down as answerable to God's and my own account. Now we can only really speculate about why Albert Dunn was disinfecting his form and perhaps it was a reaction to the Spanish flu pandemic, which had ended just a year before really in um, 1920 and perhaps just as we are today more rigorous about washing our hands perhaps um, Albert Dunn here was being just as conscientious and and with absolute good cause. So let's take a look a little look um, some three years before the uh, 1921 census of England and Wales was taken. Some three years before, Albert Dunn filled out his census return and spilled crude carbolic over it. And it, we're going back to May 1918. So we're still in the midst of the Second World, First World War even, my apologies, um, at when the first rumours of the so-called Spanish flu reached the United Kingdom. And most of my talk today is based on newspapers that can all be found within the Find My Past newspaper collection. And so on the 29th of May, 1918, the whole Daily Mail reported, and you can see a clipping here on the left-hand side of this report. Practically all Spain is affected by the mysterious epidemic resembling influenza, which is raging and causing many deaths. So many workers and government offices are down with it that public business is greatly hampered. Many private firms have had to close for want of staff. Two thirds of tramway staff are laid up and the service has had to be greatly curtailed. So the article goes on to report how 90,000 people were suffering from this mysterious illness across Madrid, uh, Barcelona, Zaragoza and the rest of Spain, as well as the Canary Islands. So this, this type of reporting was how the flu pandemic became known as the Spanish flu. Reporting restrictions were not as stringent in Spain, whereas in other countries like Britain, Germany, United States, reporting was restricted 
uh, due to the ongoing First World War. So the illness, the flu, became very much associated with Spain, uh, a country that was suffering particularly badly, but was more open about it uh, in the press. And it was it was bad. It was it was bad in Spain. On the 30th of May 1918, the Liverpool Echo reported how half of Parliament are down with the disease and the Spanish king himself was taken ill. The report goes on to say, there is little movement in the streets. Most of the theatres have closed and half the government staffs are laid up. And I don't know about you, but I really feel there's a very eerie parallel to those days of lockdown that we, we all remember so well, um, the empty streets and, and the closed businesses. But despite these, these frightening reports that were coming out of Spain, British, some British newspapers were keen to downplay the rumours. And you can see a clipping here from the um, Hartlepool Northern Daily Mail, also from the 30th of May. And this carries an, an update from the Spanish ambassador who said, the epidemic which has broken out in Spain is not of a serious character. The illness presents symptoms of influenza with slight gastric disturbance. And one, uh, Dr. Legru of the Pasteur Institution in Paris, he was, he was inclined to agree with this survey. And he was quoted in the Scotsman newspaper as saying, it is very infectious. The infection spread to Paris, then to Spain. The Spaniards made a great fuss about it, but for that, it would not be noticed today. So, you know, he's quite, he's condemning the Spaniards here. The Spaniards are making a fuss. It is infectious, but it's not that bad. But we with all the hindsight in the world, Dr. Legree's statement here, you know, it, it was, the Spaniards were so right to make a fuss. And the doctor was right as well in saying that the disease was infectious and it was coming to Britain. So by the end of June, 1918, the Spanish flu had reached Britain. And on the 28th of June, the Dundee Evening Telegraph reported on the death of an Indian seaman named Nain Zuela in Hull. And you can see a picture of the Hull docks there on the left hand side. And Nain Zuela's death and his name would, may never have reached the headlines, only that he had died from the disease, and I quote, popularly known as the Spanish influenza. And an inquest into his death determined that the young seaman had contracted Spanish flu shortly after arriving in Hull and that it had sadly caused his death. The Spanish flu was in Hull uh, and one doctor was treating 100 patients a day. And he told the newspaper it was his opinion that the epidemic should be short, though sharp. Sharp it would be, short it would not be. And the Spanish flu was soon taking hold beyond Hull. And you can see uh, a range of uh, headlines here. So the Dundee Evening Telegraph was reporting that schools were closing in Wales, with many miners in the Merthyr area becoming ill. In Cardiff, postal deliveries were disrupted too, as per postal workers fell ill. There were some really disturbing rumours from Belfast as well, that victims' bodies were turning black as coal an hour after they died. Whilst in Dudley, in the West Midlands, scores of children were being carried home after having been taken ill. The disease was, was rampant in Carlisle, whilst in Derby, munition workers, tramway employees and clerks were all affected. Meanwhile, in Manchester, schools were threatened with closure and one factory had 500 employees absent. No doubt doctors were seeing a very busy time. And I'm sure most of us, again, can recognise much of the panic, uh, the rumours from the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak in March 2020. People must have been desperately frightened, compounded with the war that was still going on. One can only imagine uh, the fear that people must have felt at this time. Precautions, however, um, were quickly to be taken. And we see that guidance was offered uh, by Manchester Medical Officer, Officer Dr. James Niven, which is published in the form of this public notice and reproduced in the whole Daily Mail. There are six items that uh, Dr. James Niven advised, including number one, the sick should be separated from the healthy. Number two, 
persons attacked by the influenza should at once seek rest, warmth and medical treatment. Number three, discharges from the nose and mouth should not be allowed to get on to get dry on a pocket handkerchief or inside the house or the workshop. Number four, infected articles and rooms should be cleansed and disinfected. Number five, those attacks should not join assemblages of people for at least 10 days from the commencement of an attack. And number six, special attention should be paid to cleanliness and ventilation. People should wear warm clothing and avoid unnecessary exposure. And indeed, we can recognise many of these precautions here from 1918 as those that we've employed in the last couple of years, uh, especially the uh, 10 day isolation uh, from point number five. And amongst all of this clamour and all of this noise, this panic, people were beginning to lose their lives across England and Wales and beyond. And the Spanish flu has always been noted for how it attacked young people, fit and healthy people. And one of those particularly young people was Eleanor Frances O'Donoghue. And we, we wouldn't have known much about 13 year old Eleanor at all, apart from how her death was reported in the Nottingham Evening Post on July the 2nd, 1918, so very soon after the pandemic reached Britain. And there had been an outbreak at her school of St Vincent de Paul in Westminster, and the 13-year-old had been taken ill with a headache on the Friday night, and she died the next morning, complaining of giddiness. Her life was tragically cut short. And because she was such an early victim of the pandemic, her name was reported in the press. Of course, there would be so many more deaths and there would be so many more nameless victims. But Eleanor's death, because it came at the beginning of the pandemic and because she was so young, the tragic quickness of her death was picked up by the newspapers. And we can see movingly uh, little Eleanor's record in the 1911 census here. Uh, Eleanor O'Donoghue, and she was five, attending the same convent school where she sadly died um, some seven years later. She would not feature in the next census of 1921. And a few weeks later, the Gloucester Journal reported on the death of the Reverend Harry Charles Horsley, also from the Spanish influenza, and he was from Wally Range in Manchester. He was just 29 and he had a young wife. So again, another young, fit, healthy victim of the Spanish flu. And we can see Harry's record here in the 1911 census, where he was listed as a divinity student. So the time between his death, he had gone on um, to become a minister. And he had also married as well. And what I found particularly moving about the notice of Harry's death in the newspaper was the description of his funeral. Um, it was held um, at the Manchester crematorium and the chief mourner was his mother for his widow and his sisters were unable to be present during owing to illness. So like many during the recent COVID-19 pandemic, Harry's wife and his sisters, they, they couldn't go because of illness and they were unable to mourn him as they might have liked due to the Spanish flu pandemic. And so around this time, it's not surprising that people were trying to look for something to blame. They were trying to understand why this, this vicious disease that struck people down in their prime, why was this happening to them? Now, the Porter Down News on the 29th of June 1918 gave quite a sensible explanation for the spread of the disease reporting that soldiers coming on home on leave might have brought it from the front. And the same article also reported how, however, others blame the war bread for the outbreak. You can see an advert for the said war bread here, uh, which could be improved with Brito margarine. And many with more show of reason attribute the Spanish flu to the general food scarcity and the short commons to which all have had to submit with the consequence reduction of vitality, which weakens resistance to any epidemic. So the conditions of war, with the deprivation that it brought, the movement of people that it, it witnessed, this made for a perfect set of conditions for this disease to thrive. 
However, there was another cause, um, another explanation that was touted um, as a reason for the outbreak. And this particular explanation, you can see a clipping here underneath the picture of uh, troop movements, uh, comes from the Yorkshire Evening Post on the 10th of July 1918. It says, in Spain, it is stated, people say that the influenza epidemic came from heaven as a punishment to those who persisted in singing a particularly ribald song. When anybody was seized, he was reminded of the fact by his friends. Ah, you have sung, sung the song, they said. People were always looking for a reason behind something and punishment from God. Probably not the reason behind the Spanish flu epidemic, but um, interesting nonetheless. And as the Spanish flu pandemic began to take hold in Britain, Advertisers were quick to seize on this as an opportunity uh, and began to peddle a myriad of different cures or uh, items that could prevent the disease. And the Sunderland, Sunderland Daily Echo Shipping Gazette printed this public notice, which you can see in the middle there, in July 1918. It reads partly, the disease is most infectious and it is necessary that all possible precautions should be taken. One case today may mean a hundred tomorrow and thousands within a week. The symptoms are readily recognisable, consisting of extreme lassitude, aching of the limbs and headache. There is generally, but not always, nasal catarrh. Now, you would be forgiven for thinking that this is official um, government information. Because it reads like that, public notice. You would, you would definitely think that this had come straight from the government. But... No, indeed, in an age when advertising standards are not as they are today, this public notice was peddling former mint tablets. And you see uh, on the uh, left hand side, just up there, the illustration, that's, an, that's another uh, uh, um, advert for former mint tablets for when you're traveling on, on the tube and someone's getting right up in your face, I'm sure. Some of us have had that experience. Um, so former mint tablets were sold as the best means of preventing the infective process and it also promised to cure the Spanish flu. And also on the market you could find Q pills. Again, these could were pr promised to prevent and to cure the Spanish flu. Meanwhile, Newman's Fort, Re Fort Reviver, taken two to three times a day, could also prevent infection. And this is the advert on the, the right there. And that was promised to be rich and fruity in flavour, um, and it could tickle the palate most pleasantly. And finally, there was a chymol or, or shymol, which was a pure, delicious superfood. Now, this, this is a description that is, is very ahead of its time. And this contained red bone marrow, sweet fats and a fine barley malt, all to build up your natural resistance to influenza. Now, whether these, these uh, cures worked or not, what they did, they really played on the population's fear. These, these advertisers, these brands were really jumping on the bandwagon of the Spanish flu and saw it as an opportunity to make money. And you can imagine that people, people would have done anything, I suppose, with all the death that they have witnessed during the First World War. And as people got sick around them, I'm sure many people would have, would have, would have resorted to such cures. And there were other preventative um, measures that were, were being taken. And on the left here, you can see a, a wonderful photograph from the Daily Mirror. And the Daily Mirror is a wonderful uh, resource. You can find some great photographs um, all the way from um, 1906 uh, up to the 1990s. And here, ammunition factory workers are, be are being given quinine as a sure defence against the so-called Spanish influenza as the Daily Mirror writes. And indeed, the doctor who attended the inquest into the death of little Eleanor O'Donoghue recommended quinine as a preventative measure too. And the coroner asked the doctor whether it should be taken when ill or before, and the witness, the doctor, replied before and every day. And you can also see this illustrated advert for car soot in the Irish Independent. Now, you were supposed to place five drops of these into your handkerchief uh, to secure immunity in the train, the bus, the office and the workspace. 
And, oh, and also the theatre as well. Now these, I, and I'm not sure what you were meant to do with your handkerchief. I suppose you were going to hold it to your face to prevent um, the ca catching the Spanish influenza. And this, this really put me in mind of the uh, plague balls that people used to make uh, many hundreds of years ago. Uh, the little, the little sort of balls of um, sweet smelling flowers to try and to try and ward off the plague. So talking of the plague, uh, the the sphere in 1921 made actually made a comparison with the Great Plague of London from 1665 with the the influenza in London um, from 1918 to 1919. And newspapers are a, a, a wonderful resource because not only do we find these these illustrations, we also have. The, these graphs. It's not just uh, news headlines. There's there's so much more uh, depth and detail in our newspaper collection to to um, to find. You know, there, there's science, there's sport, there's there's a, a, such a wonderful array of content to be found in our newspapers. And and this particular chart is is just one of them. And the uh, comparison with the, the Great Plague and the death rate. Is, is an illuminating one here and the, the plague killed many, many more. Um, and this this chart also shows that um, there were several waves uh, to the pandemic. Um, so just, and, and that was just like today. So the first wave hit in July uh, and it killed 11821. And the second wave arrived in October time, lasting until December. And a third wave hit the capital in March 1919. So we're, we're all very well acquainted with, with such peaks and troughs through the recent pandemic. And the Spanish flu, it was, it was very similar in this way. So as, as well as charts, uh, our newspapers contain maps, and this is also uh, from the sphere, and this shows the spread of the Spanish flu across the three different uh, waves. And we can see from this particular chart how the first wave was confined to Europe, to North America, uh, to South Asia, India, China and Japan. And the second wave saw the Spanish flu spread into South America, Africa and Australasia the third wave being over the same area. And because the Spanish flu, it's important to remember this, that it wasn't just confined to England and Wales, uh, we compiled some reports from across the world. So September 1918 in Sweden, there were 50,000 people suffering with the disease. In October 1918, Hungary was particularly badly hit. There were 100,000 cases in Budapest. And in the same month, there were 180,000 cases in the German army. Whilst in November 1918, about two thirds of the inhabitants of Reykjavik were suffering from influenza. And in many families, every member was ill. And banks in the Icelandic capital were only open for two hours every day. Now, one of the victims from the second wave of Spanish flu was Henry Lewithian Barge. He was 30, he was only 34 and he was a civil technical advisor to the British Admiralty. Hence why his death uh, made the national press, it was reported um, in the Globe uh, from October 1918. And Henry again was so young and he had married in 1913 to Edith Louisa Bloxham. And here is the transcript of his marriage from our Essex Marriage Index. And you can see that he was married on the 19th of July, 1913 at uh, Canvey Island. And so we found his widow, Henry's widow, Edith, in the 1921 census of England and Wales. And there are 2.2 million widowed people in the England and Wales census of 1921. And that's both men and women. And of course, for the for the women widows, we would think that a significant proportion might have lost their husband during due to the war. But what about those who had lost their spouse to the Spanish flu? And Edith was one of those widows. And, you know, it's particularly poignant when we look at this document. There's there's so much that we can find out from this census record. We know that 
Edith is, is 28 and she's living with her two young children, Henry seven and Charles five. But that, that, that her identification as a widow is, is only half of the story. What happened? What, how, how did she end up this, in this state, in this position? And the answer in this case is the Spanish flu. So it's really showing how our newspapers and our census records can really be used together, brought together to tell a very detailed story of those from the past. And especially in this instance, where we can find out that Edith was widowed due to the Spanish flu pandemic. And here, this is um, Mark Sykes pictured here and well, to give him his full name, um, which is Colonel Sir Tatton Benvenuto Sykes. And he was another victim of the Spanish flu. Uh, he's, he was well known at the time. He was a conservative party politician. He was a soldier. He was a diplomatic advisor. And he succumbed sadly to the disease in February 1919. And that was during the third wave of the epidemic. And he was just 39. And profoundly enough, he, when he passed away and when he contracted the Spanish flu, he was in Paris as part of the ongoing peace negotiations. And we can see him here in the 1911 census alongside his wife, also Edith, at the time they were staying at the Coburg Hotel in London. And here is the date of his death, the 16th of February 1919. And this can be found in our wills and probates collection. And like Henry Barge's widow, Edith, Mark Sykes's widow can be found in the 1921 census. And again, she's listed here as widow, another person who has been impacted by the Spanish flu. And it's not just Edith, of course. Uh, you, can, she can, you can see that she's detailed here, that she has uh, five children and four of whom are on this uh, census return aged between four and 16. And for the youngest, Daniel, who was only four, he would hardly have remembered his father, um, a real tragic victim of the, the, the Spanish flu pandemic. So not only were the losses of the First World War permeating the 1921 census of England and Wales, so were the losses suffered during the Spanish flu pandemic. There must be so much pain in the writing of that simple word, widow, one can only um, imagine. And so the third wave of the Spanish flu hit in the spring of 1919, just as Europe and indeed the rest of the world was trying to get back on its feet after the devastation of the war and the pandemic of the previous year. The Lancashire Evening Post in February 1919 detailed the situation in Vienna, Austria, where 40,000 people were suffering from the Spanish flu. And the newspaper contained this chilling report, which you can see quoted here. A special all-night service of electric coffin cars has been inaugurated in Vienna. These are ordinary tram cars which have been converted into hearses, each holding 32 coffins. These coffin cars collect the dead from the houses and convey them direct to the cemeteries. And in May, the disease was raging with renewed violence in Petrograd and Moscow. And by January 1920, nearly two whole years after the start of the pandemic, thousands of cases were being reported from America. And this is where this famous photograph was uh, taken. And the Spanish flu, it wasn't over yet. Indeed, our newspapers actually reveal how there were still cases of Spanish flu being reported into 1921, just as the 1921 census of England and Wales was about to be taken. In April 1921, just two months before the census was taken, the Gloucester Citizen reported how numerous French military barracks at present occupied by young recruits of the 1921 class who by common consent show an ex exceptionally fine standard of physique, have been attacked by an epidemic of the Spanish flu. Well, it wasn't over yet. You know, it wasn't just confined to 1918. And the article went on to give a supposed cause of the outbreak and the steps that were being taken to combat it. 
According to medical officers dealing with the outbreak, the disease has been spread mainly by bugs, which seem to have invaded the parox in large numbers. Energetic measures, states the Paris correspondent of the Times, are being taken to combat the epidemic. But there have been several deaths recorded at Orleans and in the military hospital of Le Poix. And as the winter of 1921 rolled around, the inevitable winter flu drew comparisons with the deadly Spanish flu pandemic. Indeed, the Yorkshire Evening Post reported how, and this was in December 1921, London is experiencing a very severe epidemic of influenza once more. Though not as serious, generally speaking, as the Spanish flu of 1918, it is overwhelming in its suddenness and exceedingly widespread. But this flu, whether Spanish or not, was still alarming and, and the quickness with which it impacted people must have put the population in mind of the deadliest deadliness of the Spanish flu. And we remember Liz Lelena O'Donoghue and how quickly she succumbed at 13 years old, a headache in the evening, and she had sadly passed away by the next day. And it, this outbreak in December 1921 was was just as alarming. And the, a report of the Hull Daily Mail on the 8th of December wrote this quite personal uh, account of this particular outbreak of flu. He says, dozens of people with, within my own personal circle of acquaintance are down with it. And they are all, and they all give very much the same account. One day they are apparently in normal health and the next they are in bed with doctors in attendance living on a severe regime. And he gives an, in, an example of how quick this particular uh, strand of flu could strike. He says, a young man whose brother was suddenly attacked and had to lay up, went around to call to the doctor. He never dreamt that he was at least unwell himself, but on arrival of the doctor's house was so ill that he had to receive medical attention on the spot. Which is just it's just shocking, you know, you pop around to the doctor and then you're ill too. And you can, you can understand why people you would be so scared, you know, we've already suffered through this pandemic. Was it happening again? But the newspaper, the whole Daily Mail, gave some advice for combating the flu, some of it probably more useful than others. The best preventative is to keep warm, fit, cheerful and avoid crowded places. Keep in well-ventilated rooms, refrain from hugging the fire and feed wisely but not too well. And quinine and cinnamon are again popular specifics, taken beforehand as precautions. I love the idea that keeping cheerful can help prevent the flu, if only. Anyway, the Nottingham Evening Post of December, uh, 13th of December 1921, was quick to disassociate the Spanish flu uh, with the flu that was currently in the city of Nottingham. It reported how there is at present a malady, uh, an influenza epidemic in Nottingham. But the Post understands on reliable medical authority that the troublesome winter ailment is not in its most dangerous form. It has no connection with the terrible Spanish flu, which claimed so many victims years ago. And we can only really imagine how reassuring this must have been for readers who, again, must have feared uh, a return to those devastating days of the pandemic. This was the winter flu, not the Spanish flu. And on the lighter side of things, which we probably need, um, in the 1920s, there was a racehorse called Spanish flu. It was when um, you, you research the term Spanish flu, or again, uh, Spanish influenza, that was usually the name that it was given in the newspapers, just because uh, that was the more sort of formal word. So always be aware when you are uh, searching in the newspapers that words do change and the ways that we refer to things do change. Of course, popularly, yes, Spanish flu, but again, you will find many more articles if you use the word search terms Spanish influenza. And so when I was using the, the search term Spanish flu, I discovered this racehorse from the 1920s uh, named Spanish flu. Not quite sure the, whether this was in good taste or not, not in good taste. And this horse was owned by the Marquis de Lano, and it ran races in France, including the Prix de Villiers and the Prix de la Prince de Monaco, which actually won, beating the horse which had run, won the Nice Grand Prix. 
Now these races, and you can see um, various reports here, and these are taken from our sporting newspapers. Um, so these were run in 1924, and perhaps by then the the memory of the Spanish flu, the pandemic had faded. Perhaps it was felt to be sort of less acute that it, it was in the past. And so I think the naming of this racehorse, Spanish flu, represents uh, an important cultural moment that the Spanish flu had had passed into the past. It was a thing of the past. You know, you couldn't have that horse running around at the, the height of the, the Spanish flu. So, again, you know, this this is this, this is a movement. We are getting over the Spanish flu. We are putting it into the past. But again, even though we were, we were, for the population across the world would have been busy trying to forget about the Spanish flu, beyond 1921, there was still its legacy to contend with. And the echoes of the Spanish flu were to permeate into the 1920s and beyond. And again, we see here on the right hand side, this advert from 1922, when the Spanish flu was again being used as an advertising medium. Now, this was printed in the Belfast Telegraph from June 1922, and it's an advert for phosphorine. And if you search for phosphorine in the pages of Find My Past newspaper collection, you will find a myriad of different adverts, and they're, they're very clever. Uh, I found adverts for phosphorine that were directed specifically at lamplighters and also to housemaids. So they were not averse to a bit of unusual um, advertising, uh, targeted advertising, one could always say, quite a, a modern thing. Uh, but this one, this particular advert, uh, uses uh, Madame Tony Farrell and her experience with the Spanish flu. And she was a composer and concert artiste. And she writes as part of this advert, I had a touch of rheumatic fever and later on a dreadful attack of the Spanish flu caught at the casino at as Jacaris. I returned to England last January so terribly run down that I couldn't even sit upright. Somebody suggested phosphorine, the easiest thing in the world to take, so I found, and I can honestly say that it did me no end of good. In a week or two I was able to work again, and in more months seven new songs were placed, thanks to my good friends, the little phosphorine tablets. Meanwhile, there were echoes later on in the decade of those first 1918 rumours from Spain. And this report came from the Nottingham Journal from January 1927. There is a widespread epidemic of influenza in Madrid. The illness is of a mild type, at first affecting the trachea and nose and causing severe neuralgia in many of its victims. In the last influenza epidemic here at the end of September, many people collapsed suddenly for 48 hours. Would history repeat itself? Would this be another Spanish flu? And we, that was certainly a very, very real fear. And in the same month of January 1927, the Aberdeen Press carried reports uh, from home, from, from London, where business offices were being seriously hampered by depleted staffs on account of a wave of influenza which is sweeping over the metropolis. That in itself is not so remarkable as the fact that cablegrams are reaching London from almost every capital in Europe and from the United States telling a similar tale. I noticed too that it has attacked Japan, where the new Mikado is stricken with it. As in the case of the 1918 epidemic, when it was known as the Spanish flu, the present epidemic appears in a variety of puzzling guises. So again, this, this is nearly 10 years after the Spanish flu. Comparisons are, are being drawn every time a new outbreak of flu came along. It was, it was inevitable that those alarm bells would be sounded. And then again, in October 1928, the Leven advertiser rung that bell of fear, warning, beware of the flu, fears of a grave epidemic. This, the article read, fears are entertained in medical circles that the wave of influenza which is sweeping over Scotland and England may rival in gravity the deadly epidemic of so-called Spanish flu in 1918. This was 10 years after. Would it happen again? Could it happen again? But the Spanish flu massively was not to repeat itself, despite there being no vaccine like we had, we're lucky enough to have today. 
However, many, many, many more people died from the Spanish flu, and that was at least 50 million worldwide, which is more than all of the soldiers and civilians who lost their lives in the First World War. It kills indiscriminately, both young and old and in between, at a time when Europe was on its knees. It would have a profound impact on all those who lived through it, and the memory of it was, was hard to shake off. And so there was little wonder every time a new flu outbreak happened, it was compared to the Spanish flu. And it's just like us today who have lived through the COVID-19 outbreak, we will never forget living through it, the likes of which we never, we would never hope to see again. And so we take a moment here to remember those victims of the Spanish flu and all those lives who were, were changed forever because of it. So thank you ever so much for, for joining me and uh, for joining Socks here who, oh, Socks, can you say hi? He's just having a little clean. So thank you so much for, for joining us today for this, this talk on the Spanish flu. You can research it yourself uh, find out more in, in our newspapers and just have it in the back of the mi your mind when you are looking at the 1921 census of England and Wales, how it might have impacted your ancestors. Thank you very much.